Hello, Norris. Hello, Garrett. Thanks so much for joining us today. Hi, good to see you. Awesome. Well, we're really excited to talk about uh, Moniz and, and the different products um, you're launching, especially the credit builder tool that you've launched for UK customers. So can you start by telling us um, what this tool um, is going to do for your, for your customers in the UK? Um, Norris, Garrett, I, I, anyone can take it yeah, away. I'll, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, I mean, a key piece here is you know, there's a very large population of customers in the UK who are what we'd call credit invisible. So they've no limited or no credit history. Uh, so they, they really struggle to access low affordable lending, but actually it also restricts their life in other ways because credit files are used for all sorts of parts of their life. Um, so, and, and also when we look at Moniz's customer base, we also have a large portion who have kind of non-standard income and non-standard you know, work, you know, key essential workers. But again, that really makes it difficult for them to access credit. So really this is about building a foundation for the customers so they can actually you know, start to build that history, start to build both with Moniz and with the credit reference agencies so that they can access other services in the market as well. Mm. You mentioned Moniz's um, customers um, and, and I know uh, Romania is a key part of your customer base. Tell us about that. And I, I, I also know that a huge part of that base is non-English speakers. Can you tell us, um, you know, the history behind that and, and how that came about? Yeah, maybe I'll, maybe I'll go first here. <clears throat> so Moniz is very much um, built on the belief that everybody should have access to low-cost financial services, banking services and credit. So based on that belief, we launched our services in, uh, in the UK first in uh, 2015. And we started initially to uh, uh, bring into our platform people who were coming from abroad. Um, the people moving from, let's say, Europe, from US even, and, and Romania to the UK to work, to build a better life, to study and so on. And we really enabled them to uh, uh, get really gr quick access to banking services card, account and so on and since then we have launched also across Europe we have uh, built a reputation as a primary account so many of our customers actually bring in their salaries and they trust us with uh, their uh, whole uh, all the money that they have oh. now uh, starting from the the KYC and onboarding next evolution next step obviously is going beyond that going also beyond customers who are new to the country. So today we have been uh, looking in our, at our database and it's very clear that our customers uh, uh, have uh, uh, slightly changed. So we are not uh, a preferred choice uh, as a banking service, not only to newcomers, but also people who have been maybe domestic, local um, uh, since birth, but they have a slightly untraditional uh, uh, income pattern. So. Imagine a Uber driver or uh, a Deliveroo driver, for example, here in the UK. They may, ha may have uh, multiple sources of income and the income also may be fluctuating. So one week or one month, you have slightly more or less. And banks typically, uh, typically struggle with uh, understanding uh, the behavior of these customers and they find it very difficult to offer things like credit to these customers. So therefore, these customers are uh, typically uh, credit invisible or they are offered really high cost credit. So this is uh, where we see an interesting opportunity and we believe that this is, will be something that in the, in the future years will become a main focus point for many, many other players in the market as well. Namely, making credit more accessible and mm -hmm. using other sources of uh, data such as open banking and so on, uh, apart from just credit reference data. And we have, the we have built a foundation because as I mentioned, a large proportion of our customers are using Moniz as a primary account, meaning that we see the income, we see the transaction of behavior, we see where customers are spending, how they are uh, spending, and, and this makes um, uh, us, uh, basically gives us incredibly um, a powerful sort of a starting point uh, in order to make better credit decisions. Mm. And, and you mentioned um, untraditional workers, and I think that's where Trezio um, come, comes in, um, um, which Garrett um, founded, mm -hmm. I believe, um, with self-employed workers and 
um, I think it's independent workers, self-employed workers, um, being able to push into credit and, and lending for this group of people. What are the opportunities you see with this acquisition, um, this gig economy workers? Um, I, I don't know if, if, if Garrett or, or Norris, anyone of you wants to take this? Um, I'm, I'm happy to take. I mean, really, I suppose at Trezio, we were very focused on these non-standard workers, helping them helping them build effectively a financial safety net, as we called it, which included credit, insurance. And over, over a kind of a, a reasonably extended period of discussions with Norris and the team, like the overlap of you know, mission and vision and kind of the customers we were targeting, it just became obvious that we could do more together. So that's so, so, you know, we completed the acquisition late last year, which means now we're, you know, starting to deliver products to the Manis customer base, um, Credit Builder being the first one. So Trezio, along with other things, was a, is a, an authorized lender. So we're able to actually, you know, build these products, you know, take the, take the decisions that other lenders may struggle with, you know, actually build the models and build the data to actually be able to, you know, underwrite credit, starting with a set credit builder. And then we've got kind of a, a roadmap of credit products we want to do for this customer base. Hmm. Um, Norris, you touched on um, KYC um, and I wanted to come, come back to that. I know with Moniz, um, yours is a bit proprietary and you had to, you couldn't build. You didn't build it as the traditional KYC, like you said. Your customers are expats or people who come in the country who might not necessarily have a utility bill that you know a traditional bank will will ask for. Can you tell us about your KYC checks and and how that's been working so far? Yeah, absolutely. So from day one, we knew that a traditional approach is unlikely to work. So if you ask customers utility bill, um, if you ask these customers who are new to the country, if you ask utility bill issued in that new country, it's, it's very unlikely that they will have that such paper. And typically banks don't recognize any paperwork that is issued from abroad. <clears throat> So from that perspective, we started to build, we, we went back to basically first principles and, uh, and tried to really understand what is the purpose of, of KYC and how to take it to the next level. <clears throat> so uh, I believe we were one of the first or the first in, in the UK who introduced a truly um, a mobile um, a KYC process or onboarding process where customers only required a mobile device with internet connection and, uh, and an identity document in order to actually onboard. So we really aim to make sure that uh, things like proof of address and so on um, uh, are, we are able to uh, uh, go through this particular um, uh, bit using geolocation and uh, certain other data points in order to um, not ask paperwork from customers when they don't easily have it uh, accessible. But things have moved on quite a lot. So, I mean, we have been up and running for, what, six years right now. So this means that we have uh, obviously developed our technology and uh, take it to, taken it to another level. So we work also with many data providers uh, uh, across the world and Europe. So we use multiple providers to extract, um, let's say, facial uh, data points from when customer is going through, basically recording a, sm a small video uh, with us to onboard and also to extract um, any data from identity documents and so on. So it's an uh, incredibly modular and so smart system that we have built um, uh, that takes really into account the customer's location, uh, where they actually are residing, uh, what kind of uh, uh, nationalities they have, citizenship, and what kind of document they actually have. So it's incredibly modular and smart system that uh, gets developed every single day. We are, we're never dropping their attention um, uh, on it. So it's it's constantly on the move. Hmm. And I, I want to come to a comment that the FCA, uh, a report that the FCA recently issued on digital challenges um, starting to weaken the strongholds of um, large banks, um, talked about the competitive pressures and innovation, which the FCA acknowledged was really helping consumers get access to um, lower prices, um, a greater choice of banking um, solutions, and obviously on the convenience. With this, um, I don't know, with this comparison with, with large banks, I'd love to get your, your, your thoughts on that. Um, where digital challenges like, like Moniz um, stand um, with large banks? 
Uh, this, <clears throat> this is such a broad topic. So I think uh, fun fundamentally, we started from the point of KYC and making things accessible. Mm. Uh, but we now know that credit is, is actually, now that um, sort of a digital banking revolution, let's say, or evolution has been ongoing for a number of years, I would say that so it's much easier for, um, for, for people to actually access digital banking platforms such as Moniz these days. It's not that, it's not a massive blocker anymore. It's still a blocker, but not a massive one. But where we are seeing that uh, the blocker still remains incredibly, incredibly large is the field of credit. So this is exactly why we're working with Garrett and his team at Trezio and uh, making sure that we are able to uh, again, think outside the box and not rely on just traditional ways of uh, scoring uh, somebody's credit worthiness. So trying to take the data that is available, you just have to work harder. So I think this is the main uh, differentiation between us and the mainstream banks is just we are willing to work harder to get to the customer and to give customers what they deserve. Mm. And, may and maybe just add, maybe just sure. adding to that on the credit side, you know, traditionally credit processes in, in institutions have been very standardized. You fit the profile, you get the credit. The challenge, the real challenge is there are so many people who just don't fit those profiles. And one of the things that the, the one of the extra things obviously being digital brings is, as, as Mara said, we, Nara said, we can work harder on data. We can also more hyper-personalize. We can look at products differently and we can we can recognize that just because you're working in a different way doesn't necessarily mean you're not a good credit. Whereas obviously products that have been built over the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years, just assume you're employed, you have a payslip or you're a business. So it's kind of really just recognizing that the world has moved on and designing mm. products that work for that. That can then be also digitally delivered, which obviously makes them makes them economic to deliver where your know, traditional kind of branch delivered products may not have worked for these kind of um, demo, these kind of subsets of customers. Hmm. And looking at other challenges, um, operating as full service banks, I know Starling is, Monzo is, Revolut is, is still waiting on their banking licenses. Muniz doesn't have one yet. I know you operate as an um, electronic money institution. What, any, any intention to apply? Um, any um, challenges around that without the banking license? Or does this classification suit you in, in, in your mission today? Maybe I'll start, uh, Garrett. <clears throat> so from our perspective, uh, every time we, we make a decision regarding uh, how we want to be regulated and which license, license to get and in which jurisdiction, <clears throat> it almost boiled, boils down to what do we actually need? Uh, so e-money license was, works perfectly well if you want to um, uh, offer our customers payments and, and um, you know banking accounts and so on. Now, um, in order for us to offer credit, uh, we need some form of license. So credit license in the UK that we now have um, through Trezio enables us to actually do balance sheet lending as well without requiring a bank license. And I think we are not saying to a bank license as such, but we don't have really at the moment a, a, a plan to acquire one because you would only need this if you're able to really make the um, uh, you know unit economics work because bank licenses can actually be quite uh, quite expensive as well to to maintain and acquire so it's all about you know, unit economics whether it makes sense so if you take deposits and uh, and uh, credit and uh, and lending out and uh, taking customer funds in it really we are looking at from that perspective whether it makes sense or not and today it doesn't make sense which is exactly why we have gone down the uh, UK credit license route uh, versus a bank license route. And Garrett, obviously, you're an expert in this field. Yeah, I mean, I think you, you've covered it there. I mean, really, the key piece is with with a credit license now as part of the overall kind of portfolio and manies for some of these products where there may not be an obvious partner lender, we can actually build that foundation with Credit Builder and some other products we're building. But actually, over time, like a lot of other products we've done, in in Manis, you know, there's there's partners there as well who are specialists in certain types of products that we will also work with over time. So it gives us that kind of flexibility to, you know, to to build and manuf and you know manufacture the products that we think make sense for us to do ourselves, and also to work with others without the, you know, cost and you know mm. overhead of of a bank license. 
Yeah, awesome. And and still on regulation, um, when it comes to open banking, I, I know it's really um, opened huge doors for um, digital um, challenges like yourself. What, what has that um, experience been like navigating um, that regulatory um, system? Um, I, I can take a bit of that. I mean, there's, there's two sides to it. There's Manise customers can now access their data through other services through open banking because Manise provides those accounts. So in similar ways to you know, other bank, your account with other people, you can bring it into money you know, um, aggregators and also other lenders can access that transaction data. And as um, Norris said, a large portion of our customers are primary account users. So that's important. On the other side, then from a Kind of access to data where customers have multiple accounts it gives us the ability to it gives us the ability to access transaction data that maybe customers are, don't have on monies so customers who may not have fully moved primary to monies or had uh, activity prior to on board to come into monies it allows us to get that data easily and readily obviously there's a, there's a very clear customer consent journey but it, it allows the customer to give us that data which means we can feed it into models um, rather than being relying on printed statements or very limited amounts of information. It gives us access to much more, much higher depth of information. You know, on, when we were building products at Trezio, we were also using it around income and smoothing, but it's, it's the same idea. It's how, how, do we, how do we help the customers give us the data we need so that we can actually underwrite them when they might not have your traditional credit file? So that's why, and you know, it's now working very well. Obviously it's taken time to get up and running, but it is actually working very well. All right. Um, I want to move a bit to cryptocurrency. I, I think it's very, it's hard to talk about payments these days and not bring up uh, crypto and, and blockchain. And I, I know Norris, I've read interviews in the past where you said you were very excited about the opportunities being, being offered by the blockchain world and being able to send one money, uh, money from one place to the other, but it was just not something you were able to do yet. And I think uh, regulation was, was a part of it. Where does Moniz fit in this um, crypto blockchain ecosystem? And, and where do you see it going from here? I think Moniz itself is uh, <clears throat> in quite an early stage when it comes to um, uh, really looking at crypto. So I, I think our starting point probably would be uh, looking at any, any type of crypto uh, as an asset uh, versus um, something that you would transfer. So I think um, we, we definitely are very keen to introduce something to our customers that customers uh, want and is that is also relevant to our customers. Because keep in mind, as I mentioned, our customers are slightly different compared to mainstream customers. So we always try to understand what, uh, what they require from us. But yeah, I think... Um, uh, from us, it, uh, from our side, just uh, looking at it as an asset and what can it do for our customers as, a, as an asset and the preservation of uh, you know, the, the capitals that our customers have and, and also potentially increase that. Mm. I think it's something that banking partners will have to be comfortable with as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And, um, but as we see, you know, crypto, blockchain, it's becoming more and more mainstream every day. And uh, so I think uh, what we have seen also from uh, large banks is that quite a few of them have made uh, pretty big bets in the, in the space. So um, I'm very hopeful that um, in, in the years to come, it will become even more mainstream. Mm. Talking about the years to come, um, I'd like to get both of your thoughts on some of the emerging trends you see in the digital banking space, um, UK, Europe more broadly, and particularly in this very uncertain uh, pandemic landscape? Um, so what I, what I see right now is in, uh, especially when we look at digital banking and um, when, uh, when we started uh, several years ago, um, along with some other names that you mentioned, I think it was for the industry and for our customers, it was incredibly difficult to see uh, what is different, what's the difference between these all these players. But right now, I'm um, uh, I can pretty comfortably say that uh, customers now fully understand where one service provides different kind of value to them. And I think people just the way they go to a, a shop, a supermarket, and they they choose different products. 
I think our customers and everybody else's customers now know exactly uh, what the differentiation are, what the differentiation is, and and uh, what kind of service work with them. So I think this is something that is has become very clear in the past uh, few years. And I think uh, when we look forward uh, to the future. Um, the differentiation becomes even clearer and our path is very clear in front of us so we are going down exactly the same route as we um, that was our starting point so we aim to provide more value to customers uh, who are you know coming from untraditional um, uh, income patterns and uh, customers who are hard to serve because not because they have bad customers but because they are uh, coming from different backgrounds so i think this is a trajectory that we have uh, uh, chosen and it's been serving us very well. Mm. Garrett, any thoughts on the credit on the credit angle? I mean, it's 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 probably what I said previously. There's you know, it serving these untraditional customers is important. I think people are really starting to recognize that you know the traditional kind of products don't work for a lot of these customers, and as that portion of the you know, that's it's a growing workforce as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's important that we do new products. I think that's that's a key piece. And also, you know, bun, you know, putting things together in different ways. So we haven't mentioned the kind of protection type piece that we have at Manise around insurance. So so we're also, you know, we're doing things that aren't your aren't what your typical bank would have done to actually think about how do we how do we help and protect those customers through their journey from as many as Nara said from kind of basic banking and payments through to protecting some of those payments in terms of insurance and then through kind of credit from both a both a simple protection but also from a you know you know ambition and wanting to live their lives and also coming back to your uh, the question that you asked about sort of covid for example and so on mm. i forgot to mention earlier that uh, covid actually has supercharged uh, the opportunity in mm. front of us is is I don't think nobody nobody was able to predict this, but uh, people stayed at home and uh, the user behavior uh, fundamentally changed. And for us, we actually saw an increase in payments. We saw an increase uh, in our customer salaries. You know, many people who uh, went out to the street to work to deliver the goods and food, uh, they actually picked up more work, more jobs. They started to get more bonuses and, and, and uh, overtime pay. So it's been uh, uh, very good. COVID has been very good for our customers. And as we see that pe- more and more people are now working towards uh, gig economy, you know, the, the nature of work has fundamentally changed. So less people in the office, many people, you know, developers working in, I don't know, Portugal for an American mm-hmm. company. And then at the same time for a German company, um, I would say the nature of work has uh, has changed, and we we are definitely there to take uh, take also see an opportunity there. Mm, awesome. I mean, the gig economy with the numbers we're seeing, I think it's it's up it's up from here. It's it's not um, go, going back to the previous numbers. It, with with this digital, um, I mean, riding this digital wave, and and like you said, um, COVID has been good for business. What would you say is the biggest challenge the bank faces today? From my perspective, what I clearly see is the speed of digital transformation that they need to to take. Um, uh, Right now, customers are demanding more. They are staying at home. They don't go to branches. They expect their bank to be technologically up to speed and online services must be fast. They must be easy to understand. User experience need to be great. And this is where digital challenges like ourselves are definitely winning uh, customers' hearts and minds. So uh, my message to the big banks really is that uh, you've got to really think long and hard, not long and hard, but very quickly, basically, about digital transformation. And, and uh, COVID has pro- uh, provided a fantastic opportunity to, to think about it. And I'm, uh, I'm you know, on a daily basis interacting with many top banks, and I see that they clearly have prioritized the transformation. So ultimately, what I see is that uh, the, the best will um, succeed. Mm-hmm. Customers will win and uh, definitely user experience across the market or across the space will, will increase sharply. Mm-hmm. With um, the acquisition of Trezio and, and also this year, earlier this year with the launch of the credit builder, what are some of your biggest priorities for this year moving forward? 
Um, I think uh, right now uh, Garrett and his team is is very much uh, sitting uh, in on on the front seat in terms of what we want to establish uh, this year. So maybe Garrett, you want to? Uh, yeah, I suppose you know credit builder, as I said, is really the foundation stone. So we've got that now with a with a kind of select group of customers with the intention over the next month or month or two to start rolling it more widely to our customer base. But that's really the first step. We then, over the course of this year in the UK, initially want to start rolling out other credit products that that, that kind of product actually bedrocks, so enables other customers to access, you know, credit credit products for them to spend spend and also to access longer term personal loans. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we're also now quickly starting to look at how we replicate the appropriate products into our main European markets. Mm-hmm. So really that's a key focus. Um, you know, Credit Builder on its own, it, it's a very important piece of the jigsaw, but it's really just that starting point mm-hmm. that actually allows our customers to take that first step on the journey. Um, and, then, and then from there, it's continuing to do more things around helping them build that credit, but also actually starting to help them actually access credit. All right. One one thing I wanted to flag is that uh, <clears throat> a few months ago we launched our fintech as a service uh, business line. So we uh, have built over COVID, we have uh, improved our technology to a point where we are able to make this a, make it a platform, and we are able to provide other uh, banks uh, and fintechs with with a solid uh, technological platform for them to scale fast issue cards, issue accounts, uh, make payments work uh, fast and, uh, and cost effectively and so on. So we signed up our first client, uh, strategic client, uh, Investec Bank. Okay. And we are now in discussion with many, many others. So the uh, fintech as a service side of the business is also basically something that we really want to focus on in, in 22 and, and beyond. Awesome. Well, I, I read that it took Moniz um, 42 months to get to your first million customers and only eight months to get to two million. So I, I guess um, the, the bank is on, is on an upward trajectory and, and, and I'm sure you're going to do amazing things. Thanks so much for making the time today. This was very insightful and yeah, I look forward to keeping in touch. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you. Thank, Thank you. you.